Welcome, everyone. My name's Kathy Koo. I'm the executive director for Challenge Success. Thank you all for being here on a Friday night and being here to support the mission of Challenge Success, healthy kids, stronger schools. And we have a great program for you tonight. Um, and I'd like to start out just by thanking uh, our sponsors tonight. Uh, we have two uh, corporate foundation sp sponsors, Healthy School Initiatives, Sequoia Healthcare District, and yes, and Sutter Health, Palo Alto Medical Foundation. Thank you to both of those sponsors tonight. Thank you to our individual sponsors who bought sponsor tickets to support the event, and to all of our advisory board members and board members for supporting us in every which way. Um, but most of all, again, thank you for being here. Uh, I look forward to sharing um, a nice night with you with our panelists, Dr. Denise Pope, Dr. Madeline Levine, and our special guest and keynote, Dr. Ken Ginsberg. Uh, before we get started, uh, we're going to show you a little video just to get you thinking about um, kids and kids' voices. And this is a video that was produced by one of our student teams from La Cañada Public High School. When Challenge Success um, brings a school into our program, we ask that the program, um, that the school bring to the program a multi-stakeholder team. We ask that educators join the team, uh, administrators, fa uh, re fa rest of the faculty, counselors, parents, and students. These students in particular went back to their school, started a Challenge Success student club, and produced this video. Enjoy. Better grades and test scores and GPAs. Definitely defined by your grade point average. It's a high GPA. Good grades, good test scores. Grades and test scores, you know, like getting straight A's, taking all the hardest classes, getting to a good college, and you know, getting a good job, making a lot of money. Being at, at least as good as your parents in terms of like earning money. How you're doing in your classes compared to like class rank. Like a high pristine college. Making plans for your future in terms of college. Going to a good college, and I don't think it should be that way. Going to Ivy League college. Getting to some top-notch Ivy League school while at the same time, like a, you know, be a star athlete or a star musician. Numerous uh, extracurricular activities. How many APs you take, how involved you are at school, how much things you can balance, like how much can you cram into one day. What college you get into, your GPA, your SAT scores, how involved you are with the community, if you're doing all those extracurriculars, and if you are considered like the top student. If you're improving on what you're doing and you're enjoying what you're doing. Making yourself happy. Being happy with yourself. Being happy, like being in a career that I'm passionate about. Being happy. Being happy with like, what you're doing. Achieving what makes you happy in life. Finding happiness. And it's being satisfied with your position. Being content with what you already have. Finding what I'm passionate about and knowing what I'm going to do and doing it well. Succeeding in what I do and uh, having a good time doing it. Just trying your hardest. If you worked hard. Doing your best. Uh, trying your best and getting better. Achieving personal goals. Make some sort of positive difference in the world. Just making a positive influence on people you meet. Following your own ambitions regardless of what other people say. If you wake up every day and you're excited to start the day because you know you're going to enjoy what you're doing, that would uh, be someone who's successful.
So with that, I'd like to introduce you to our two co-founders um, to share a little bit more about the video and students and challenge success. First, we have Dr. Denise Pope, senior lecturer at the Graduate School of Education at Stanford, uh, an author of the book Doing School and the co-author of the book Overloaded, Overloaded and Underprepared. We also have Dr. Madeline Levine, another co-founder of Challenge Success. Madeline's a clinical psychologist, national speaker, uh, uh, author of the book The Price of Privilege, and her second book, Teach Your Children Well. Uh, I'd like to welcome them both up to the stage. Are you coming? Yeah. All right. Welcome, welcome. This is, believe it or not, this is our 14th year Jeez. doing this annual parent education conference. And once again, we have filled, you know, the biggest auditorium on campus. So thank you for being here. We're, we're thrilled to be here tonight. Yeah, that deserves a round of applause. Sure. <laughs> Before we jump into the content, I just want to get a little sense, and maybe we can, um, if, you, if you look really hard, so we can see the hands, Madeline. Um, we'd love to know who's in the room. So raise your hand if you are a parent, guardian, or grandparent of a high school student. Raise your hand. Ooh, that's a biggie. Okay. How about a parent, guardian, or grandparent of a middle school student? Okay. You have a lot of kids. Parent, guardian, or grandparent of an elementary school student? Uh, how about pre-K? Okay, fewer. How about college or older? Okay. Raise your hand if you're an educator. Whoa. Raise your hand if you're some kind of clinician, health uh, education, counselor, doctor. Okay. And um, if you're a student, are there any students in the audience? I know there's some grad students. Yeah. And a few, few middle and high school students. Good. And is, this is your first Challenge Success event. Raise your hand. Hey, Whoa. welcome. Hey. We're thrilled to have you. That's great. Well, as you know, that the, the student film was made, um, as Kathy said, from the La Cunada High School Challenge Success Club. And we work with teams all over the country um, to make changes in, in policies and practices in order to provide kids with the academic, social, and emotional skills they need to succeed both now and in the future. And what you heard in the video is what we typically hear when we go around and talk to students, that there is this one very narrow definition of success that is really extrinsic. Grades, test scores, extracurriculars, how much you can pack into a day, you heard that one girl say, um, and of course college. And I don't know if you heard, but it wasn't just any college, right? They were talking about Ivy Leagues and prestigious colleges. And then when we ask how they define it, very different, right? Happiness, passion, satisfaction, doing something you love, fun, um, try your best, make a positive difference. So one more time, raise your hand if you think your kids or kids in your life or who you work with would relate to the kids in that video. Raise your hand. Yeah, it's something that we hear a lot. And it's actually one of the reasons why we got our name, right? Challenge success. So we are challenging that very narrow notion of success that you have to do these things, get the grades, get the scores. As one kid said, get into college in order to make the money. Like it was a direct line, like that's what you do. Um, and that's too narrow. So this is why we flip success, right? You can see we flip success backwards there because we're challenging that narrow notion of success um, that it's measured by performance, grades, test scores, where you go to college. And we know that real success is much broader. And it's achieved not just at the end of a semester, but over the course of a lifetime. And while this is a parent ed event, we at Challenge Success, as Kathy said, prioritize student voices. They are the ones that are living the experience day to day. They're the ones who often have the very best ideas about how to make changes at school and at home to increase their well-being. So this year, we're showing the video in, in a way to honor all those student voices and to share what they wanted parents and educators to hear. In fact, when you, you saw what, you know, what do you wish your parents knew, what do you wish your teachers knew, those are actually exercises that we do when we go to schools and talk to kids. We actually have them do those exercises and then report back to the teachers and the, and the, the, the parents. So it was wonderful that they made this video. So we have um, a three-pronged approach to helping schools and families. And uh, first of all, we, we work with schools to provide the research-based um, 
uh, strategies for policy changes. So if your school has a late start or a, a modified block schedule or a new homework policy or a new AP class policy or um, is focusing on project-based learning or test calendars or student teacher advisories, chances are Challenge Success is working with your school and that's why they have those policies. We hosted this year 43 teams of students and teachers and parents and administrators from all over the country who joined us for a full day of workshops to develop plans for change. And for the first time ever, we had um, a seminar with over 60 educators from 30 different schools and districts that we called our Summer Leadership Seminar. And very, very exciting news this year, we just opened up our first East Coast office of Challenge Success. So we are really on the move and really excited. Tell them where. Um, so it's in Boston. Uh, John lives in Maine, but his catchment area is Boston. I just came back from New York. We have many schools just kind of on that whole side of the country, and we are on the move. So um, the, uh, the third component of our work is our research, and we um, benchmark our progress using school surveys, um, and we find and translate the latest research on best practices for schools and parenting. So when you leave tonight, we're going to give you a little uh, guide, a little tips uh, for parents, and we are inviting you to our website to look at even more guidelines and tips and research, and we'll be sharing some of that tonight. And of course we do parent education and community education, which is what tonight is all about. So this theme, tonight's theme, is fostering resilience in children and teens and why it matters. And I don't know if you saw the New York Times piece on anxiety last weekend, Madeline and I were both cited in that, but it, it hits you really hard that if you're too anxious to get out of bed in the morning, if, you're, if you um, can't bounce back from the inevitable setbacks in life, then, then no, nothing what we do in school matters, right? We have kids who are too anxious to even go to school. So the number one important thing, right, is gonna be health and well-being above all else. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to my, my, my friend and colleague, Madeline, who's gonna say a few words about this notion of resilience and share what she's been seeing from her work around the country with kids and parents. Okay, hi. <laughs> <laughs> so after this um, piece came out, um, on kids, I've gotten five phone calls from kids around the country saying the first boy who's, who was a very good student um, and who ended up non-functioning saying, that's me. So I want you to be aware that it's not just troubled kids who are having difficulty. I think it's all kids that are having difficulty. Um, and by the way, I also think it's parents who are having difficulty. Um, I think the, I said earlier today, um, I don't like the word failure particularly um, because I think as a parent, it's very hard to make the case that, you know, you want your kid to fail. None, most of us in our hearts really don't like the idea of seeing our kids fail. Um, but we want our kids to have the kind of resilience that allows them to stand up again after they hit inevitable problems. And life is about inevitable problems. Um, when our children are young, we seem to be able to tolerate that, right? So you have a young child, and she takes a couple steps, she falls down, right? And nobody gets hysterical about that. We go, come on, you know, come on, sweetheart, stand up again, stand up again. And she takes a few more steps, and that's how she learns how to walk. Or our eight-year-old rides a bike, and he falls off the bike, and now it's a little bit more, he doesn't have a padded bottom, so he skins his knee, and again, hopefully we're saying, come on, honey, get up, try it again, you can do it. And we don't get excited about that um, because we know that children don't learn without having repeated experiences of getting better at things. Nobody starts out being capable. Nobody starts out being competent. You build self-esteem by getting good at things, not by having your parents tell you you're so special. So this experience of trying and failing, failing and trying again and, and having support um, and framing it, I think, either as you uh, succeeded or you learned. Um, if your child doesn't do either of those, then that's not a very good experience. Um, so I think that one of the things that's happening, one of the reasons why we're seeing this epidemic, and it really is an epidemic of anxiety. It's now the single greatest diagnosis of teenagers. It used to be depression, it's now anxiety. Is because we don't have places that um, take children in, uh, love them for who they are, 
allow them to fall down without getting worked up about it, um, and have a home to come back to that feels calm, where you, do, you know, kids are always mimicking in my office what it looks like when they come home, and they're really good at it. Like mom is standing at the door, and it looks like she, she's concerned about the day, but she really wants to know what the, what the test score was, or did they make the varsity team, or, you know, and, and, and kids are brilliant at picking up kind of bullshit nonsense from their parents, right? And what you really want to do is provide a haven for, for your kids. You want to provide a place of unconditional love. You want to provide a place that's free of all that anxiety because my guess is everybody in this auditorium is carrying anxiety genes, right? Somebody in your family didn't drive a car or stayed home or whatever. We all have this stuff inside of us. And what makes it, what makes it an epidemic all of a sudden? Um, I'd make the argument, and Ken knows a lot more than I do, but I'd make the argument that what's happening is you stress kids enough. It's the stress diathesis theory. You stress kids enough, and that, that anxiety gene, which might have lain dormant, um, all of a sudden gets, gets uh, expressed. And I, and I think the same thing is true for us. It's not just our kids who are anxious. It's parents as well. And, I, and I'm going to invite you to think about how stressful your own life is, whether or not you have enough bandwidth to provide a warm and nurturing and quiet environment for your children to come home to, because they need that um, in order to be restored. It's restorative for us, and it's restorative for our kids. Thank you. So now it's our pleasure to introduce our good friend, Dr. Ken Ginsberg. Ken is a pediatrician specializing in adolescent medicine, and he's the co-director of the Center for Parent and Teen Communication at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which is officially going to launch in a few months, and it's super, super cool and exciting. He is also a professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. His goal is to translate the best of what is known from research and practice into practical approaches parents, professionals, and communities can use to prepare children and teens to thrive. Does that sound familiar? He's got the same goal as Challenge Success. He has more than 130 publications, which is outrageous, including original research articles, clinical practice articles, parenting books, and a toolkit for youth serving professionals. He also serves as director of health services at Covenant House Pennsylvania, an agency dedicated to Philadelphia's homeless and marginalized youth, and he's charged with mission fidelity for all Covenant Houses internationally to prepare sites of what it means to serve youth with unconditional love and absolute respect. And we have absolute respect for you, Ken. Absolutely. So come on up. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Good evening. We're going to be talking tonight about resilience. But to begin to think about resilience, what we have to do is really uh, put on our parenting hats in a different way and understand that our goal, our real goal, is to be pro-development, to support the development of our kids. And what that means is that when we think about success, we have to think about it differently. Because what we tend to do is we tend to look at the child in front of us, whether that kid's four years old, eight years old, 12 or 17, and we tend to overfocus on one of two things, either happiness or their grades. And an overfocus in each of those two things not only is not being pro-development, but it can stifle development. Why? It's too easy to be happy. If you give a four-year-old a, a cookie, they're happy, right? You give a 12-year-old a bike, they're happy. You give a 16-year-old a car, which you absolutely factually and statistically should not, they're happy. <laughs> um, but happiness is too easy in childhood. What we have to do is we have to stop looking at the child in front of us and begin imagining the 35-year-old devel you're developing. Why? Because it's 35-year-olds who are going to be settled, who are going to have a family, and who are going to begin to run our world. So what are we looking for? What does it mean for that 35-year-old? We want them to be happy. But what does that mean? It means to have a sense of meaning and purpose in your life, to have relationships that matter. What else do we want? We want these kids to be prepared to repair our world, tikkun olam, which means that they have to have a different view. Their compassion has to be energized. Who are adolescents? 
adolescents are the people who have not yet learned to avert their eyes to human tragedy and injustice. That's who they are. And we have to nurture that, because if they're going to be compassionate, we want people who are going to walk down the street, and when they look at someone who's downtrodden, rather than looking at them from the framework of what's wrong with you, they understand that something happened to them. What else do we want? We want those kids who are going to be hardworking, who are, have tenacity, who have grit. Angela Duckworth's concept of grit, let me explain it to you in 30 seconds or less. How do you look at the world? Do you look at the world as a marathon, in which case you're looking far in the distance and planning ahead? You know that life is pretty complicated, so you want a cheerleading squad behind you because you didn't think you could do it on your own. You think about the obstacles and think about getting around them. And if you fall down while you're running a marathon, what do you do? You get back up. Or do you look at life as a sprint? Which means you're going to run as fast as you can and do whatever you can to get there, including tripping the guy next to you. And if you fall down, what happens? It's over if you look at life as a sprint. When we are focusing only on school and pretending that that is the end goal of development, we're asking our kids to run a sprint. We're also asking them to launch into adulthood with a whole lot of them feeling like they failed if we look at school in the wrong way. What else do we need? We need kids who are going to be creative and innovative because all the best ideas they haven't even been thought of yet. What else do we need? We need those kids who are going to be hardworking, but in a way that understands that they can't do it by themselves. They have to have collaboration skills. They never would have thought of purple. They think of blue. But when I speak to you and you think of red, suddenly we're something even more terrific together. We need kids who can take constructive criticism. Because if you can't take constructive criticism, you simply can't um, thrive in the workplace. We need kids who, can, who are going to honor diversity. Now more important than ever, we need kids who understand it in a different way. What does my generation do? As a 55-year-old, what do we do? We look and we count complexions. We look and we count genders. We look and we count sexualities. And if there's enough different people in the room, we say we've achieved diversity. That was never diversity. That was tokenism. Diversity is when you have a very clear sense that people who are different from you have more to teach you than people who are the same, and you honor it. You honor their earned wisdom and ask for it to be shared. And diversity, a true understanding of diversity does not divide us. It unites us to look towards common ideals by learning from other people. That's who we need our kids to be when they're 35. And what else do we need? We need them for it to be resilient. Because as much as we wish we could protect them and, you know, wrap them in downy quilts or bubble wrap them, it's not possible. So the best we can do is prepare them to bounce. You guys down with that definition of success? All right? So the question is, how does your adolescent think you would define success? And I really couldn't answer it better than your film just did. I really couldn't answer it better. And that's why I'm so proud to be part of Challenge Success. Because this isn't an adult model, down on kids model. It's learning from kids and honoring their wisdom and experience. Resilience. It's about the ability to overcome adversity. It's the capacity to bounce back. It begins by being a mindset. To understand the resilience mindset, you have to understand that we all come from the jungle. 50,000 years ago, that's where we were. And here I am in my jungle chair 50,000 years ago. What's the most dangerous thing that can happen to me right now? A tiger comes and attacks me. What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to jump and I'm supposed to run. So let's talk about the stress response. Because if you understand the biology of stress, you begin to understand how to intervene. So the first thing that I do when I need to jump and run, where do you think I need the blood right now? It's all about the butt, which is the jumping muscle, and the legs, which are the running muscles. Where do you get that from? If a tiger did walk in the room, what do you feel? The first thing you feel is butterflies. Why? Because 50% of your blood, if you had dinner, is in your belly, and it needs to go to your butt, and butterflies is the blood going, Psh! isn't that cool? <laughs> then your heart beats fast. Why? So you can pump that blood, and then you sweat so you can cool off while you're running. Your pupils get big so you can jump over the log. You breathe fast so you can oxygenate that blood, and you can't think clearly. Why is that? Because you're not supposed to turn to the tiger and say, I don't know, can we work it out? 
And you're also not supposed to turn to the tiger and say, how does it feel to you to think about eating me? Right? <laughs> so you can't problem solve and you can't empathize. So the mindset of resilience begins by understanding what is a real tiger versus a paper tiger. And if we are raising a generation of kids who believe that a B plus is a real tiger, they will not problem solve and they'll lose the ability to empathize. Resilience is not invulnerability. Guys, I've written a bit about this stuff. Let me tell you, I could move into your house and I wouldn't raise an invulnerable child, nor would I want to, because I want your child to be empathetic, to be compassionate, to be kind. And let me tell you something, as much as we worry about anxiety, we're working with kids who can feel. So for those of you who have kids who are anxious and who are depressed, congratulations. Our challenge is not to suppress their emotion, it's to teach them how to leverage the gift of emotion to be able to deal with life and to understand what is worth being anxious about. What's a paper tiger versus a real tiger? Here's the bottom line of resilience, and I can teach you this while standing on one foot. The people who make it in the world are the people who've had at least one adult who believes in them without condition and holds them to high expectations. Who's that adult supposed to be? And when it is, that kid feels secure for the rest of his life. And what is unconditional belief? Is that like, dude, it's okay to do drugs, darling? Unconditional belief means I'm not going anywhere. My presence is truly unwavering. It is reliable. You are not a bumper sticker on my car. You are something I believe in. Because the most protective force in a human being's life is to be known. What is love? Love is seeing somebody as they deserve to be seen, as they really are, not based on something they might be producing or a behavior of the moment. That's what love is. And what is high expectations? It's not about grades, it's not about trophies, it's not about scores, it's about living to be your best self. Who are my girls? The 22-year-olds who are amazing kids and we're the easiest adolescents. But let me tell you who they really are. They're the four-year-olds who wouldn't let us turn off the lights during the summertime. They called a family meeting to make sure we didn't do so. Why? Because they were scared of the dark? No, because they were worried about the moths. They were worried about where the moths would possibly go. So they called this family meeting and we strategized with these kids how to turn off the inside lights, turn on the outside, and give them those yellow flashlights so they could walk the moths out to be with their moth grandmas. That is how delicious my girls are, and the most protective force in their life is that I really know them. The rest is commentary. So we're practically done, but we've got another 35 or so minutes, so let's keep going, all right? Um, so young people rise to the expectations we set for them when we see them as they really are, not based on what they produce. And when do we use that? It's not just about school, guys. We're not talking about school, we're talking about life. So this is my favorite picture of um, my kid's childhood, which I know is a little bit odd because she has no head. Um, but this is Tali, and it's Valentine's Day. And um, it, she's three and a half years old, and I got all, both of my girls and my wife, all three of my girls, I got them chocolate roses. And Tali ate hers, and she thought it was delicious. She thought it was so good that she wanted to eat Alana's too, but was pretty sure that if we couldn't see her, it would be okay. <laughs> right? Where's my developmental pediatrician? So the best picture of childhood, right? Um, so do I yell at that child? Do I make her ashamed of her experimentation, of her testing her limits, of her figuring out who she is? Or do I remember who she is? And do I confront the small problem she's given me in the context of her existing strengths? That's how we bring our children back. There are two big questions that I think are the hardest questions of parenting. And we are going to, in a whirlwind, go through them tonight. The first question that I think is hard is, so can I get it? Like, you're talking about this unconditional love thing, and that's awesome, but you're also talking about high expectations, so I'm really confused. Because aren't those things in conflict, to love without condition and to hold to high expectations? And I've already tried to begin to answer this, but we're going to go a step further. And the second question that we're going to tackle tonight is, oh my God, I want to protect my kids so badly, but if I protect them too closely, how do they learn life lessons? Because I believe that can protect them as well. So it's that internal conflict that you're trying to figure out. So let's begin with this one. 
How do we love our children without conditions but still hold them to high expectations? So let me give you some more um, issues around resilience. This is the, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics model of resilience. It's my model masterfully stolen from the people on the bottom who are mostly positive youth development folks. The first thing that we need for kids to have is confidence. And we know exactly how to give it to kids. It's why, you know, Madeline talked about this, about making how we made kids feel. We, we created kindergarten curricula so the kids would learn how special they were. We gave them butterflies on one of their first days to draw in. The kids drew in the butterflies. And our, our responses, the teachers were specially trained to say things like, look at your blue. You're a wonderful artist. Look at those eyes. Look at those stripes. And then the butterflies would get put up on the walls. And the lesson for the day was what? You're all beautiful and special like butterflies. The next day, they would cut out snowflakes, and they'd all be unique. What was the lesson for the day? You're all unique, like snowflakes. Coaches were taught to not um, criticize their kids, and parents were taught to catch their kid in every possible opportunity, doing terrifically well. Look at you, Tommy, coming down the sliding board. Look at you, you're brave and you're intelligent and handsome too. You're doing it, you're doing it. Never giving credit to gravity. Look at you, Tommy. <laughs> and what happened to this generation of kids? The, the, um, a, a little bit narcissistic, a little bit needing attention, um, and um, the highest levels of depression and anxiety we've ever seen. All right? Um, real confidence comes not from showering vapid praise on people. Real confidence comes from competence, right? It comes from the skill sets that you have. Next, connection. There is nothing more powerful than human connection. There's nothing more powerful or protective than to know that someone has your back. Next, character. Having an understanding of what is right and wrong. Make absolutely no mistake about it. It is your job to teach kids character, right? That is what is going to make them grow regardless of whether or not the rest of the community shares those core values. Next, contribution. Having a sense that you matter. But it's more than that. You know, the ultimate act of resilience, the ultimate act of resilience is to turn to another human being and say, brother, I need a hand. That's who survives. Do you get that? In times of war, in times of pestilence, the people who survive are the people who reach. The question is, what is it that enables you to feel like you can reach? And the answer is to not believe there's pity on the other end. If you believe that there's pity on the other end, you're not reaching. Think of me at 17, right? So, by the way, 17 is the best thing that ever happened to me because my life's work is about taking away shame and stigma from the help-seeking process, right? So thank God for 17, all right? The point is that um, what the reason we want our kids contributing is not because we want um, to uh, uh, put it on their college resume. It is so that they can have the experience of how good it feels to serve. And what that means is that when they are ready or need to receive, they can do so without shame or stigma. They understand that that other person doesn't pity them. They serve them by choice. Next, coping. I could give you a two hour talk on eating disorders, maybe more. Three hours on drugs, four hours on sex. I could do all of these talks and I would ask you not to ask me to. Because everything that we fear in adolescence, cutting all of these things, they are all a response to stress. And telling kids what not to do simply doesn't work, it stresses them out more. What does work is building in them a wide repertoire of positive coping strategies so that they can move forward. And finally is control. You either believe that you control your universe or you believe you are controlled. And this begins with discipline. Are you gonna be someone who's gonna raise your kids and say, um, you're gonna do what I say, why? In which case your kid's gonna feel small. Or are you gonna make them understand that you are pro-development and your goal is to have them become responsible and a contributing member of society and your job is to keep them safe and you will give them more and more freedoms and allow them to stretch when they can handle those freedoms. Why does it feel like our connection is challenged during adolescence? Why, I want you to think of every developmental milestone as if a kid is crossing a chasm. They are crossing a chasm and it's 12 feet across and it's 100 feet deep. How do you cross? You jump, from where? Not from here, because if I jump here, I'm not making it. I move backwards. 
I cover my eyes and take a flying leap and hope I get to the other side. Why do our kids sometimes act as if they hate us during adolescence? What's going on? So you're having, you're raising your children in this wonderful, warm, cozy nest, and all your child has to do <coughs> to eat is open her mouth, and then these two big birds hand her these juicy worms, and it's wonderful. And then brain puberty strikes about a year before body puberty, and suddenly you realize you're going to need to become independent. So you look back at that nest and it doesn't look warm and cozy anymore. It actually looks rather prickly. And you look at those birds that are bringing you the worms that you appreciated so much a year ago, and you're actually embarrassed by the way they breathe. <laughs> and then as you move further down adolescence and you begin to realize that you actually do need to fly ultimately from this nest, you look at that nest and you don't see it as prickly, you see it as absolutely uninhabitable. And if you didn't, you would never leave. The reason our kids act like they hate us so much during adolescence is because they love us so intensely that it hurts. If you know that and you believe that, you can make it through anything. <laughs> um, adolescence is about risk taking. If you're going to be ready to fly from that nest, then you have to be able to know how to take risks. Listening. What we know about monitoring kids is that the most important thing is not what we ask, it is what we know. And what we know is directly related to what kids choose to tell us. That's what we know. So what this means is we've got to turn off the parent alarm. The parent alarm looks like this. Mom, I met this girl. You're way too young to date. <laughs> There's the lost conversation about um, sexuality. Um, or we, when we over-catastrophize, mom, I got to see you on a test, and, and, and I'm sure it's that the teacher doesn't hate me, doesn't like me. I know. I know he doesn't like you. I absolutely know that. We're going to go to the principal. We'll get him fired if we need to. We'll get you tutoring and move. <laughs> and the last one is over-empathizing. Mom, I had this really big fight with Shoshana, and I have to tell you, we were going to be best friends forever. We were going to marry brothers. Her kids were going to call me aunt. My kids were going to call her aunt, and it was going to be amazing, and we had it all planned out, and now I absolutely, completely hate her, and I never want to see her again. I don't blame you, darling. She's a little bitch, and I've never liked her mother. <laughs> when we overreact, kids stop talking. Listen to the words that Madeline said. Madeline talked about the home with almost a radical calmness with which a kid could learn from you and feel secure and bounce ideas off of you. The hovering, the hysterics, all prevents that from happening. All right? Um, I want to talk for a few minutes about perfectionism because I don't know this community super well, but I've been here a few times, and what I know is that your kids are not likely to become gang members. What I know is that their biggest danger is from perfectionism. Why is it that we don't like perfectionism? You want your kid to be a high achiever, not a perfectionist, right? If this was a concert hall and there were a thousand people in the room and I got a standing ovation as a pianist, um, the high achiever says, what a joy it is to entertain. The perfectionist says, why is she sitting down? She must be the one who knows piano best. Perfectionists loathe themselves. They are terrified of a B plus, have a tremendous fear of the D word. Darling, I'm not angry, I'm just. Um, they have, are afraid of out of the box thought and all of those things, out of the box thought, fear of the D word, fear of the B plus, leads to the death of creativity. And perfectionists resent constructive feedback. Let's go back to the beginning of this talk where I define success. Do you see the death of success on this slide? Do you see it? We've knocked out creativity. We, um, we've knocked out hard work. We've knocked out um, constructive feedback. Adolescence is the time to learn how to fail and recover. It is an opportunity. And if Madeline doesn't want us to use the word fail, I'm okay with that. Because I believe so intensely in recovery. People are uneven. And if you do not learn how to compensate for your unevenness during adolescence, you will be compensating for the rest of your life or hiding yourself. And if you are hiding your realities, then your greatest strengths will not come out either. You are looking literally at the most uneven guy in the world. I'm really good at what I do. And I can't turn a screwdriver, all right? I can't change a tire. I have, this is north, so is this. I have no sense of direction. 
People are different. Adolescence is the time for people to discover their spikes. Here's some lies you don't want to buy into. Kids, you're going to be taking a test in the 11th grade. It's called the SATs. If you do well, then life is going to be handed to you on a silver platter. If not, mediocrity at the very best. But because of this, it's so important to me that you really focus and relax when you take it. <laughs> Kids, in order to get into a good college now, you have to be good at absolutely everything. It's darling, it's why we've been in travel soccer since you've been two years old. Um, it's why I have no friends other than the travel soccer moms. It's why you've been taking piano lessons since you've been three years old to show how creative you are, but it's why I need you to be captain of the team by senior year in order to show what your leadership skills are. I need you to take lots of AP classes to be able to really stretch. And darling, I know what a good person you are, but it doesn't show easily on a resume. It's why we're sending you to Botswana for a week to build a water purification system. Um, don't just say try your best, we're gonna talk about what to say instead, because what your kids hear when you say that is, and I know you'll get an A if you do. There are other forces of perfectionism. I don't want for a minute for you to believe that this is just about school, nor do I want you for a minute to think that this is solely a parental issue. It's not, it's so much more complicated than that. I, you may or may not be part of a problem. I guarantee, however, that you're part of a solution. I guarantee it. I will also tell you that there's not another organization in this nation that understands the different issues of complexity that feed into this like challenge success. That's why I'm here, all right? Um, there are other issues, which is what are we praising and noticing in society? And what are we ridiculing? Who are our heroes? They're great sports people, very, people who are very rich. And then when they make a mistake, we rip them apart. Who should our heroes be? Social workers and doctors and firemen and soldiers, people who are willing to sacrifice for other people. That's the conversation we need to have. And the other point is that kids have a desire to spare us, right? So if you have had a difficult life, if you've survived cancer, if you've been through a difficult divorce, or if you've sacrificed a lot as an immigrant to this nation, and you have given up so much of yourself to make sure that your kids are gonna be okay, Understand that your kids understand your pain, they understand your sacrifice, and they become perfect little boys and girls in order to not make life continue to be hard for you. And as a result, in those circumstances, we don't know our kids as we wish that we would. What do we want to do? We want to build a high achiever. There are three things that I really want you to understand to get that kid to be a high achiever. The first, let kids make their mistakes. Look at this as rapid process innovation. It's gonna work, the brain is on fire during adolescence. Kids are super learners. If you prevent them from experimentation and making mistakes, then they're not gonna grow, recover, expand, because they're never gonna have this opportunity again. The brain is never gonna be as receptive to this kind of learning. Build spikes, celebrate unevenness. What does that mean? It means don't say just try your best. Try this as a paragraph instead. Darlin', I love you so much, and I expect you to work hard at everything you do, because if you don't, you will never trust the results. But when you do, pay attention to those results. Sometimes you're gonna not have to work very hard and things are just gonna come easily for you, but you're not that interested in it. It's okay, that's a freebie. Life's not gonna hand you a lot of freebies. Take it. Sometimes you have to work really hard, though, and, um, uh, but you really love what you're doing and you get something wrong and you just want to learn more about it and you get better and better and it's exciting. That's going to be your career. Sometimes you work really hard at something and you're not that good at it, but you really have fun doing it and you get a little bit better, but you're not great. It's going to be your hobby. <laughs> Sometimes you're going to work really hard at something and you're just not going to get it and you're going to work as hard as you can, try to get support from other people, but you're not very good and you don't get much better and you really don't care, forget about it. <laughs> forget about it, it's not who you are. This middle spike, I wanna give you a three minute tutorial on what Carol Dweck has taught us about the power of um, praising effort rather than results. She starts with fifth graders. She divides them into two groups. She gives them the fun part of an IQ test. Individually, she gives them feedback. This group, she says, you did really well because you are so smart. Mathematical structure of the sentence. You are so smart. This group, she says, you did really well because you worked so hard. Mathematical structure of the sentence. 
you did blank, which created blank outcome. She then says to the kids, hey kids, who would like to take another test? Who wants to do the test? Um, these kids. These kids are like, no thank you, I have my label, I like it quite a bit, we'll leave it that way. These kids are like, yeah, let me show you what I can do. But she messes with their minds and she gives them an eighth grade test. What happens to these kids who are told they are so smart? They fall apart with anxiety. What happens to these kids who were told um, uh, that they worked hard? They just keep working. Next day, she gives them a fifth grade test. The scores should be identical, right? Because we know that um, standardized testing has no race, class, gender, or situational bias. <laughs> um, what happens to these um, kids? These kids' scores go down by about 20%. Why? Because they have so much anxiety and they experience failure. These kids' scores go up by about 20%. Why? Because they didn't experience failure. They experience practice. It's not just about praise, it's also about criticism. You are a slob. Your room is a mess because you didn't do anything to pick it up. You give kids control. You make them understand they have control, and when they do, that is literally the antithesis of anxiety. So it's you did blank, and blank occurred. And what do we know about kids who are raised in that way? We know that those kids are more likely to be comfortable thinking outside the box. We know that those kids are more comfortable taking constructive criticism. We know that those kids have lower rates of anxiety, lower rates of depression. They look for life partners who compliment them rather than flatter them. They understand that intelligence is something you build. It's not something you just have. It's something you have to work at. Her work, as you likely know, is called mindset. Not all perfectionists are perfect. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to go out to Palo Alto. I'd like you to go to these communities. And I'd like you to go to the parking lots where the kids are smoking. And you're going to find some of the coolest kids in the world. Those kids who are pretending they don't care because they care so much. In an environment where success is defined narrowly, and you don't quite fit into that box, you're going to work very, very hard at pretending that you don't care. There is not a single kid in here whose parents come to a talk on Friday night who's lazy but a lot of kids who are pretending they are because they're not fitting into the box that's been pre-described for them. What's your long-term goal? Is to build a healthy adult. What is your short-term goal? To have your child love learning. And what is, oh, and that's not really a short-term goal if we can go back because if your child loves learning, she's gonna be happy when she's 120, I promise. Um, your medium-term goal is to have your child find the right academic match that's gonna foster love of learning. Big question number two. Gosh, I want to protect my kids so badly. But if I do, will they be prepared for life? How are they going to learn life lessons? Here's the simple answer. Preparation is protection. Hovering sets our children up for self-doubt today, failure tomorrow, and isolation from us far into the future. Um, we have to learn how to give kids the ability to make their own decisions. And that means we have to throw off the lecture. Here's what you need to know in a couple minutes or less. I, as a child, am a concrete thinker. It means I see things exactly as they appear. I do not think far into the future. I do not um, uh, understand the complexity of human nature. I, as an adult, am an abstract thinker, meaning that I understand the complexity of human nature. I can think into the future, and I can plan ahead. I can think about thinking. I can manipulate my environment. I can know that people are full of crap. But here's what you need to know. I, as an adult, can only think this way when I am calm. That's a fact. If I am not calm, I am thinking just as concretely as the child. How do I get the ability to think abstractly? My brain changes during puberty. And what else happens? I am exposed to life experiences. 15, I'm 15 years old, I'm a girl, and a guy comes up to me and he says, I love you. Do I say, I question the veracity of that statement indeed? <laughs> the guy says, I want to show you how much I love you. And then, um, uh, where is he the next day? He's gone. And she, she moves from here to here towards the safety of adulthood. And there's no better way to learn. And if we, the best thing we could possibly do to help our kids learn is to get out of their way 
and let them make a serious mistakes. But you're not going to do that, and I'm not going to do that. I'm a doctor, and I'm a daddy, and I don't want to get out of kids' way. So what do we do? We tell them. And we say to them, don't you understand that what you're doing right now, which I'm going to call behavior A, could easily lead to consequence B. I never imagined my little girl doing consequence B. Now I wonder what's between your ears besides cobwebs. If consequence B happens, you're more likely to go on to consequence C, which you never would have done if you didn't begin hanging out with Lisa, whose own mother doesn't love her. If consequence C happens, you're more than likely to go to consequence D, which is a slippery slope to consequence E, more than likely to go on to consequence F, which could, look at me, young man, when I'm talking to you. If consequence F happens, you're more than likely to go on to consequence G, which is slippery slope to consequence H, which God forbid is going to go to consequence I. And do you know what happens if consequence I happens? You die. <laughs> and this is what it sounds like to a kid. <laughs> and if you are running from a tiger, you cannot think abstractly, not mathematically, not emotionally, and not from the point of view of solving a problem. We have to honor the intelligence that kids do have so that we can have them figure out problems themselves. And it is, again, about changing mathematical structure. Huh, you're thinking about doing behavior A, I think I get that, but I'm worried about it leading to consequence B. Tell me what you've thought about. Have you considered this? What are your solutions? And when there at B and only when there at B, do I take them to C? And when they're at C, and only when they're at C, do I take them to D? I am giving the kid control by honoring the intelligence he does have rather than imposing on him a way of thinking he cannot do when he is stressed. Um, when do we jump in, and when do we allow mistakes in recovery? I want you to think of life as if it is a jigsaw puzzle, all right? Because what is the fundamental question of adolescence? The fundamental question of adolescence is, who am I? If you want to understand adolescent development, I want you to understand that there are really three questions. Who am I? And then the corollary questions to who am I is, am I normal? And do I fit in? Asking this question explains to you how exciting a time this is how invigorating and exhilarating this time is to figure out who you are and how frustrating it can be and how scary it can be and how we manage this is going to make a difference to how they're going to answer the who am I question. So I want you to imagine that this who am I question is laid out in front of your child as a jigsaw puzzle with a thousand pieces in it. And... Um, even worse, if you're then told, and by the way, this question, I know it's a little tough. I need you to figure it out by the time you do your college essay, right? So here's a thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle laid out in front of your kid. How do you begin putting together the puzzles if you're the child? Where do you begin? It's the edges. The power of discipline, the power of monitoring our kids is that we give them clear and solid edges that they can go against. So when we give them clear values, clear edges, adolescence becomes easier. If those edges are random and make no sense, and if they don't understand why those edges exist, it has no power. Just as love doesn't count if your child doesn't know he's loved, rules don't count if your child doesn't know why they exist. But if those rules and those edges are very clearly about um, uh, safety and morality, kids have a place to begin. Where else, what's the next step you do as you put together your puzzle? What do you do next? You group the pieces. So you put together all the reds, and then you ask yourself, is it a balloon? Is it a fire engine? Is it a cherry? What is it? So you look on the box. You cheat. Where are the pictures on the box? When we give kids clear boundaries around safety and morality and clear role modeling by being the pictures on the box, then our kids can get through adolescence pretty well. What's the next thing you do? Now it's all the random pieces. You know, those pieces you kind of shove and you put together and you take apart and you experiment with, all within the middle of the box, that's their job. That's where you get out of the way. That's where you allow for failure and recovery. 
You do not let your kids stray outside of the box, and you do not interfere within the box. If you do that, then your kid is going to um, really value your attention, value your wisdom. If you hover and if you control and if you try to control those pieces within the box, by the way, school is within the box. If you try to control those pieces within the box, you will install control buttons in your child because they will never have learned how to fail or make mistakes themselves and they will indeed resent your presence. And then you're going to lose one of the greatest things ultimately of success, which is not just raising an independent child, but raising a child who chooses to be interdependent with you for lifetime. Interdependence is our ultimate goal. When we share our wisdom but bring out theirs, kids want to stay involved with us to be interdependent over the generations. Parents, we should be like a lighthouse for our children, a stable force on the shoreline from which they can measure themselves against. We should look into the waves, trust in their capacity to ride them, look down at the rocks and don't let them crash against them, and prepare them to ride those waves. We should be like lighthouses for our children. Can I have three more? Okay. Um, the last topic I want to cover briefly is stress and coping. Resilience at its core is about learning to cope in a positive way with life's inevitable stressors. And we're going to do our greatest good by raising kids with a wide repertoire of these positive coping strategies. Stress, it's incredibly uncomfortable, it makes you sweat, it makes you smell, it makes you not be able to think clearly. It's so uncomfortable, you got to do something about it. There are positive ways of coping and there are negative ways of coping. The biggest mistake you can make as a parent is to look at the negative box and to think they don't work. They work best. That is sex out of the context of a relationship. That is cutting. That is disordered eating. That is drugs. It works great and it works quickly. And whenever you hear the, hear the word quickly in the context of behavior, you should think addiction. Our challenge is not to tell kids what not to do. Our challenge is to fill in them such a wide body of, such a wide repertoire of positive coping strategies that when life gets tough, that is the direction they naturally go into. But first, we have to help them define the stressor. Because remember I talked about resilience being a mindset? Here are three questions that I want you to begin to ask your kids, and by the way, yourselves, when something's bothering you. Hey, this thing that's bothering me, can it kill me? Because if it's not, if it can't, it is a paper tiger, not a real tiger. All right? Second, this thing that's bothering me right now, how am I going to feel in a week? How am I going to feel in a month? How many of you had grandmothers who said to you, always say to yourself, this too shall pass? Right? So um, know that something is uh, temporary. And when good things happen, stop making yourself crazy. Stop getting superstitious. Stop self-sabotaging so that you lose it and have control over the loss rather than take your chances. Sometimes good things happen because you've earned them. Sometimes you got lucky and that's good too. We talk about stress. I want to be really clear about something. You know, stress in small doses is really something wonderful. It's not something that is intrinsically bad. You don't want to go to the big game without a little bit of stress. You don't want to go to the piano recital without a little bit of stress. The tragedy is not when our kids are stressed, it's when they become numb. In order to prevent kids from being numb, what we have to teach them is how to express rather than suppress their emotions. I want to teach them how to organize their thoughts and feelings, to understand all the things that are swirling in their mind, to name it, because when you name it, you begin to own it. And then one more mathematical sentence. To be able to finish this sentence, I blanked it out. I laughed it out. I cried it out. I prayed it out. I slammed it out. I sculpted it out. I drew it out. I talked it out. I wrote it out. I don't know your kid. But life is about so much more than grades. Life is about being able to manage the rest of the kind of things that happen to us by knowing what is happening, by controlling those things, by being able to name them, and to then be able to express our emotions so that they do not shut us down. This is a life-saving slide. 
We began, you know, when Denise and Madeline were beginning, they were talking about anxiety and depression. Let me tell you why we miss anxiety and depression in kids. We miss it because we're looking for the wrong thing. When a young person looks like an adult who's depressed, we don't miss, the, we don't miss those kids. So if you smell, you don't sleep enough, you're sleeping too much, you gain weight, you're losing weight. Indeed, if you're sad and can express it, we don't miss those kids. The kids we miss are the fully 50% of adolescents who don't act sad, they're not sad. They're irritable and they're angry. Let's get back to being pro-development. If you believe the dominant model of what, how we talk about adolescents, where we roll our eyes when we talk about them, where we expect it to be normative for kids to be explosive in our houses, you put your child at risk. Yes, adolescents can be moody. But if you believe that they're truly irritable and you believe that that is normal, or you believe the myth that kids think they're invincible instead of understanding the reality that they care so much it hurts, then we lose the chance to find our kids in trouble. If your kid is irritable or angry, that is the way adolescent depression presents 50% of the time. I'm not saying it's true of your kid. I'm saying go and ask some of the child development specialists who they spend eight hours a day with, and by that I mean teachers. Go and ask them how they're performing in other areas of their life, with peers, educationally. A kid who is angry at home a little bit can be normal, stretching their wings. A kid who's angry at all the time, I'm worried about. What's the greatest gift you can give your kids? We are so focused on our children and we are sacrificing so intensely that our children begin to define us. And we begin to judge all of the decisions we've made in life in terms of career, work-life balance, whether you've stayed home, whether you've worked. We begin to try to, we all feel so insecure that we wonder whether we've hurt our kids. And therefore, we decide that the marker of the decision of whether or not we did the right thing is about the bumper sticker that appears in our car. If my kid went to a top college, I was a good parent. Stop. It's hurting the kids. It's making them worry about us. Kids, more than anything, want us to be OK. The greatest gift you can give your kid is to take care of yourself and model for them what it means to be a healthy 35 or 40-year-old. That's what they're looking for. Let me tell you something else. Denise introduced me in a lovely way and told you how many publications I have, and I really am magically impressive. <laughs> but let me tell you something. I am a youth advocate, and what I will tell you is this. I know nothing about your child. You want to really know how to work with your child? You want to know how to really communicate with your child? Ask your child. You live with the expert. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Is this on? Yeah? Okay, so for those of you, first of all, another round of applause for Ken just because he's fabulous. <laughs> for those of you who come every year, you know that we always do an interactive piece where we have you think through, weigh in um, on different scenarios or problems or issues. So we're gonna put you to the test. We have scenario number one and it is called to AP or not to AP. AP in this case is advanced placement. If you're not a parent of a high school or if you only have a preschool or you don't know this, but there are courses that are actually considered college level courses that you can take in high school that usually come with more work um, and, and they say you can get a year's worth of credit from it, but it's pretty rare. Um, so here's the scenario. Your 10th grade son is a middle of the road student has a nice group of friends, and plays guitar. He's a happy-go-lucky guy, but he just doesn't seem to have a lot of drive, and you think he's capable of more. At the end of the first semester, you spoke to him about challenging himself more at school, but he didn't really respond. Recently, his history teacher recommended that he take advanced placement U.S. history, known as APUSH, next year. Your son says he's fine in regular history and doesn't want the increased workload. What would you do? So what I want you to do is turn to the person next to you, introduce yourself, and you're not going to have a whole lot of time, but you're going to talk about what you would do. 
And then when I say stop, you're going to very nicely stop, and then we're going to talk about it here on the panel and give you our <laughs> advice. Okay? So go ahead, turn to the person next to you, introduce yourself, and tell them what you would do. Okay, so um, Madeline, Ken, who wants to start off on this? What, what would you, what's your advice, Madeline? Um, I think you give the kid a hug and consider yourself very fortunate. He's happy. He's got friends. <laughs> He's got, um, yeah, one of the things I thought about with this is um, that nobody ever thinks their kid could do less. Everybody always thinks that, right? <laughs> oh, my kid, he, you know, he really should be doing less. Um, you know, the, I don't, from a psychologist's point of view, there's nothing problematic um, that's coming up. And the other thing that's missing from my point of view on this is um, uh, lazy, disengaged, or balanced. I, I'm with you. I've never met a lazy kid ever. Uh, I've met unmotivated kids, and I've met kids whose um, interests are not valued. Um, and so I'll give a very quick anecdote of a young woman, the most amotivational kid I ever saw in my office. Two months, not a word, not interested in anything, came from a very intellectual family. One day comes in with a little portrait she had drawn. N nothing that anybody thought was stellar. And it was gorgeous. And three years later, she's at RISD. Um, it was just that what she was good at wasn't valued. And from the point of view of a psychologist, if your kid is good at anything, I, not selling heroin, but anything, <laughs> <laughs> anything where they have to practice, where they're engaged, where they're motivated, where they have pleasure, I don't care. I think all the things you need to learn in life, you learn through playing the guitar, you learn from hanging out with people. Denise has heard me say before, um, people will often say to me, my kid's not that great at school, but she's terrific at solving other people's problems. What is she going to do? And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> So um, yeah, that's my take on that scenario. Um, I, I, I agree entirely. That the piece of information that feels lacking for me is like, I know that this kid's happy, and that's great, and I know he doesn't want to take history, and that's great, because that tells me he's not really into history. What's missing is, what's he really into? Because uh, that's what we want to be supporting, yeah. you know? Well, so he I plays the guitar. I mean, he pl okay, he plays the guitar, he has friends here. Uh, so there's someone out there who's begging me to say this. Look, he, he doesn't have a lot of drive, so is he not taking AP US history because he's afraid he'll fail? Is he, if we let him just kind of float through school, um, is he gonna come back and say, hey, you let me do that, and now I'm not, you know, where I wanna be? Mm -hmm. is this, this is what they say to me. Is it, is, are we closing doors by not pushing him? I mean, the teacher recommended him to do this. Are we, are we, is he gonna be pissed that we didn't push him to do this later on? I, I just want to hear a little bit more from the kid, and I know that that like isn't perfect because we don't have him here, right? Yeah. Um, but I, but it's a really good advice to talk to the kid and find out why. That's my point. Right. It's, it's the why is missing. You've asked theoretical questions, which are great, and that's where parents come in. If uh, your kid says, "I don't want to," and you just go, "Okay, darling," and if that's the end of it, that's not parenting but engaging, understanding, and really authentically believing that the young person is the expert in their own lives, and if they can make a cogent case for what they enjoy. So being happy is great. I want more about this kid. I want to know why he's not taking this and what else he's enjoying. I don't need him to take any APs. I just need him to explain to me what's going on. Because the other thing is, I want him to own the solution. Uh, excuse me, the own the answer. Right. Because that's one of the other issues that you brought up is what's he going to say to you? Why did you not push me? Why did you not believe in me? Where do we set the bar? First thing we recognize is that it's an uneven bar, right? So it's going to be here in one subject, here in another subject, here in another subject. It's an uneven bar. Where do we set it? We listen to the kid, we talk to the teachers, and we set it in a place where if they stretch, they're going to be able to achieve it, but not above there because then they're going to feel like you never trust them or don't believe in them, and not too low, because then they're going to believe that you don't think they're capable. 
This is what communication is about. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, I was, I'm sorry. No, no, I was going to say this, this thing about closing doors comes up all, all the time. Um, and, and I want to make the case that um, doors don't close forever, that kids are in process. Um, it, it's fun for Denise and I to be on a stage together. Denise went to Harvard and Stanford. I went to the State University of New York at Buffalo, and I don't know where you went. Um, but that life is not that straight line. And um, every place I speak, I have, uh, I ask the same question. I've got about 150,000 responses now. How many of you did that straight line? And no matter where I am, it's one to 10%, which means most kids and most adults, most people have uneven development. And, and so it, it Yes, I want to know more from the kid, but there's a million things that may be in the way of his not taking it. He may be worried about a breakup with a girlfriend. He may be totally disinterested. You know, yes, you need more information, but I think our notions that the door will close if a kid misses a class or gets a C, or it's just nonsense. It, life just doesn't work that way. Uh, it's my two cents. Yeah. <laughs> So to wrap up this one, ask questions, talk to the kid, but respect his opinion. If he's cool, if he's happy, if he's got his friends and he's playing guitar and he doesn't want to take AP US history, many, 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 many successful people in this world did not take a push their junior year of high school. So, I, you know, on the one hand, you have to back off. I understand it's, a tough, it's tough to know when to push and it's tough to know when to pull back. But it sounds like in this case, we're, we're kind of united. Talk to him. But if he says, really, I don't want to take it, don't push. But, but I don't know that pushing ever works. Um, I think encouraging might, might work. And finding out what's going on with the kid works. But my, my, own ex my kids are older. So I've had the experience of seeing the things that I wanted one of my kids was 50 pounds overweight at one point, and I'm banging on him, you know, you should lose weight, you should, nothing, no good at all. He goes away to college, he wants to, he wants to look good, loses 50 pounds in a year. I, it, my, my experience is it's an internal thing, and that you can sort of set the state, oh, by the way, please don't tell my son that I told you that story, I would just get. Your secret is safe with a thousand people in this room. <laughs> I would just get killed for that. But, but, you know, it's, ra it's rare to get buy-in if there's not an intrinsic component to the kid deciding to right. do something. Right. Good, good, good. Okay, you ready for scenario number two? Do, we, do I do the clicker or do you guys move the slide? Or can you do the clicker? Okay, great. So this is athletic ambition, all right? Maybe you know a kid like this. Your 13-year-old enjoys soccer and has always been a top player on her AYSO team. Her coaches have recommended that she try out for a year-round club team and play with the 14 and 15-year-olds. She already has two friends on the team and she really wants to try out. You know there are lots of hours and travel involved and are worried about how this might impact her other interests, her schoolwork, and your family time. But you want to support her ambition to play more competitively. What would you do? You can talk to the same person or a different person and you got about two minutes. Go. All right, Dr. Ken Ginsberg, Adolescent Medicine Specialist, what do you think of this? Um, so, like everything else, I'm going to always say it's nuanced and I need more information. But there's some information here that is actually very clear. So the first thing I think about is physical health. So I have a 13-year-old who um, wants to play up with the 14 and 15-year-olds. A 13-year-old, so physical maturity is not directly equated with age, but assuming it is, um, there's a few things I know. One thing I know is that year-round of any sport is not the way human bodies are designed. That one of the nice things about playing different sports at different times is that allow, it allows muscle groups, bones, and tendons to heal when you begin having other parts of the body be used. So there's really an advantage of having different sports in different seasons. That's point number one. Um, Otherwise, it's what's called overuse injuries that we actually see go up when you stick with one sport throughout the year. Another thing is I'm always worried both behaviorally and physically when you play up. 
Um, if she's a 13-year-old with the average 13-year-old body, playing with the average person who's 14 or 15, she's really at risk of greater injury. Now, wearing my other hat, which is as a behaviorist, what I know is that the early maturers, in general, are at greater um, behavioral risk, says the boy who reached puberty at 16. Um, but, Especially I'm sorry, do you girls. want any more information about me? <laughs> um, so, um, so the point is that, um, uh, so when you take a 13-year-old and you make her primary social group people who are two or three years older, she's going to be exposed to people who are emotionally, physically, and from a risk point of view, advanced to her, and we may not be doing her a favor. Madeline? Um, yeah, uh, and I just want to add to that in terms of this early puberty that's going on. So, you know, as you well know, adolescence used to be five years, right? You got menarche at 15 and you got married at 20, and now we have very young kids going into puberty. And um, you want to keep them, especially girls, the risk factors are higher for girls than for boys, right, with early puberty. Um, so I, I think we're eventually going to have to do something about education around early puberty, and, but that's not what I'm supposed to talk about. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I have three sons, they're all grown up. Um, if you have three sons, you tend to have athletes. Some of the time, my middle kid's uh, uh, in theater. Um, but it meant that for two years, my husband and I barely spent a weekend together. Um, I was going to Northern California, he was going to somewhere in the valley, and uh, we had virtually no relationship. We both worked, and it was awful for the family. And I pulled my kid out of um, traveling team, and he was ready to be pulled out of it. Um, so it's not, it's not just about the kid, and, and without being overly cynical, Coaches are grabbing these kids. It's incredible. You're 13, and a coach tells you, you know, you're the best 13 year old player. I need you on my traveling team. That is incredibly seductive to a 13 year old. Um, and I think on, you have to sort of weight it on the other side, which is it's disruptive to the family. It's not in the best interest physically um, or emotionally, I'd add, of, of kids. Um, and it you know, the, the pull to get these winning teams is, I think, incredibly damaging to kids. And it's incredibly damaging to family life because, I'm sorry, there's one other thing I want to say about that. It, it, makes, it, it makes adulthood look incredibly boring. Um, you spend every weekend sitting in a bleacher somewhere in the middle of nowhere, California. That's true. It, it's that um, it's that 35 year old. You're modeling what a healthy 35 year old looks like, and a lot of your kids don't want to be chauffeurs when they grow up. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And part of our job is to make adulthood look like really interesting. Like you want to grow up, you want to be in the world. And so many. My, one of my kids once said, "We're all, I don't know where we were, and we're in the bleachers, and a bunch of kids come over and said he was in soccer, and he said, there's an empty soccer field over there. Why don't you all go play? Because like right. it, it models passivity, and and I don't think that's what we want to model. So, and I just want to be clear, because again, I'm I, I'm playing the role of person in the audience tonight, obviously, <laughs> um, and I am a mom of of, of two athletes out of my three kids. Um, being involved on a team, playing a sport that you love, these are, these are great things. So I don't want you to take this the wrong way. It is fabulous that she loves soccer. It is fabulous that she's um, found something that she likes and is good at and she's getting positive attention. Um, being on a team, learning new skills, putting your body in motion, all of that is great. The question is, um, the coach is doing his job. He, his job is to get the team to win, right? And to find the best people and to, and to put him through as, as best as he can. Um, your job as a parent is to really decide, is this the right decision for my child? And um, in some cases, I do know people who make the travel team work. They take the whole family together and they make a, a big sort of, you know, pillow fights in the hotels and that kind of stuff. I know people who absolutely have kids um, who can handle uh, a little bit more challenge. The question is, how do you know when that's, when that's right for your kid? And in most cases, it's not. 
So you're going to feel, and, the kid, and look, I've been in this situation with the kid crying, begging, with the coach standing there, but it's like we're two against one now, right? The coach and the kid are begging, can we please do this, can we please do this? And something in my gut just said, you know what, no. Yeah. And, and she survived, and she went on, and she plays her sport in college, and she loves it. So you just, there's no permanent decision. Just like that AP decision wasn't permanent, this decision for her not to play up is not jeopardizing her, you know, World Cup career. If she's supposed to go to the World Cup, she will go whether she joins this 14, 15-year-old team or not. There's a myth that um, Olympians start when they're, they're three. Some Olympians start when they're three, but we know many, many actually top, top Olympic or high performance athletes who don't start till they're 15, 16, 17. So I want you to, and also just know that it's really, really rare to get a scholarship or to go to the Olympic. Like, you know, like chances are she's not going to be the next, um, who's the female soccer player from who took her shirt off with the bra, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah. Chances are she's not going to be that person. So um, keep, keep the big picture in mind, the happy, healthy 35-year-old. In, in both of these scenarios, I think that's really, really key. As hard as it is to say, we're going to say no to this. We're going to pass on this, honey, and give her the reasons. Right? Right. You both agree? Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, listen, we are going to uh, wrap up. I'm going to let Madeline and Ken say some, some last words of advice when it comes to fostering resilience and why it matters. Um, Ken, you, you, you only have like two minutes here. I just did 40. I'm just trying to think of what one sentence I don't think that there's anything more important if you were to walk away um, with anything else than really what the definition of love is. Love is seeing somebody as they deserve to be seen, as they really are, not based on the behaviors they might be displaying at the moment or what they might be producing. If we have our kids know that they are loved, I mean, the other thing is, why do we love? To make people know that they are worthy of being loved. It lasts for a lifetime, if not across the generations. So. Thank you. Very nice. I guess, I guess one of the things I wanted to say is um, in the process of children becoming resilient or teenagers becoming resilient, there are challenges to us. So if we say we're going to allow our children to be challenged as opposed to fail, um, if, if we're going to see our kids unhappy if we're going to deny our kids certain opportunities, it means we have to be centered enough and certain enough in ourselves to be able to live with that. And so the expression that you know I hear, I feel too often is, I can't stand to see my child unhappy, right? I'm, ask, I'm asking, we're all asking you to be able to tolerate and encourage. If your child's never unhappy, things are not going well, right? So it's asking the parent to be able to tolerate that. If you can't tolerate your child being unhappy, you're in the wrong business because <laughs> part of your job is to be able to do that. And that, I, that, that's a self-reflective, this has all been about our children, but I think we need a lot of self-reflection about our own capacities to be able to tolerate sitting back and saying to a child, You'll work that out. You know, what you said, um, what was the expression about your grandmother said? This too shall pass. This too shall pass. My, uh, my mother always used to say, you'll work it out. You know, and, and we don't say that enough. Um, and it shows a lack of confidence. And I think we have to be uh, reflective enough about ourselves to be able to tolerate the process of our children growing up, growing away, being uneven, all the things Ken has talked about. And, and I think it's really hard to be a parent today and we, you know, to say trust your gut when there's so many things that we didn't have to deal with when we were growing up. So there's really kind of not a gut around cell phones and travel clubs and mm -hmm. APs and pushing. And so my last advice to you is you don't have to do it alone. This is why all of us are here. This is why we write books. This is why Challenge Success exists. Um, our parting gift to you tonight is a little um, card that looks like this that you're going to pick up. 
with tips to help your children thrive. These are just a few tips that you can, you know, post on a, a refrigerator as you're going to make this decision about the AP or the travel club or, you know, cell phones in the bedroom, which you should absolutely not have cell phones in your bedroom. Um, <laughs> prioritize sleep is on this list. Um, you are not alone. And we summarize the research. We have um, a website that has a ton of information on it for you. We, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And we do lots and lots of these parent education events. And we also have videos. So you don't even have to, you could be in your pajamas <laughs> and go on Vimeo and see some of our parent education um, events that will help you navigate these challenges, these, parent, these very real uh, parenting challenges so that you're not you're not alone. So I want to thank um, everyone for coming tonight and our sponsors, P uh, PAMF and Sequoia Healthcare District, our incredible Challenge Success staff and volunteers who helped us out tonight. We want to thank the Stanford Bookstore. Um, speaking of the bookstore, we will be signing our books in the lobby um, after the talk. If you want more advice, you can walk out with a book chock full of advice. Um, watch your email. We're going to send you a brief survey. We want to. We, we always value your feedback um, and listen very closely to what people say about the event and apply it to to future events, next year's events. Um, and of course, we're a nonprofit. So if you'd like to make a donation, you can pick up an envelope or you can um, get one of the text to give cards in the lobby um, where you can just text uh, in your your donation. Um, and I just wanted to finally say thank you all for coming tonight. Each of you, just by being here, has taken a positive step this evening um, and, and are really helping to make a difference in the lives of kids. You are an, a hugely important part of the solution, and it is going to take all of us working together, all of us together, to say no to the coaches or no to the APs, if, if that's the right thing for our kids, and to change the current system to work toward healthy and positive connections with our kids um, at school and at home. So give yourselves a big round of applause. Give Madeline and Ken a big round of applause. And Denise. <laughs> Thank you. Go home and give your children a kiss and tell them that you love them unconditionally. Thank you. Have a great night. Night.